What's up? I just wanted to come by and make my dinner early. Uh, I love this air fryer. Like, I really do. Um, Sorry, um, why, why are you in here? We, we rented this place. Yeah, we, I thought we rented the oh, whole room. You did rent the whole room. Absolutely. This, anything here is yours to use, but I don't have my own kitchen. I have my own bathroom. Today, I want to pull the curtain back on the urban fairy tale known as Airbnb, the belong anywhere fantasy that turned into a can't afford to live here reality show. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. It's just a couple of units here and there. How much of a difference can it really make? Well, it can be quite dramatic. It doesn't take much to tip the scales when units that were designed and zoned for housing stock are suddenly being used as hotel stock. See, prices are like rumors. They spread based on the latest bit of gossip or in market speak, the last trade. So when Mr. Moneybags Airbnb host rakes in $6,000 per month for what should be a $2,000 per month rental, every other landlord's eyes turn into dollar signs. And although deep down they know it impacts prices for regular people, they can justify it by saying, it's not my problem. I don't think we should be responsible for the housing crisis. And of course, once one gets a taste of making way more money per unit, guess what happens next? To stay long-term rentals? Uh, for the time being, yes. Um, but slowly I will be converting everything to short-term rentals. So here's where the plot thickens. Average Joes and Janes just looking for a place to crash are now in a bidding war with tourists who think $200 a night is a steal for authentic urban living. The result? Rents hitting the ceiling and suddenly the entire area is quoting prices for regular flats like their luxury condos. But it doesn't stop there. Because when renting becomes as financially draining as a four-year Ivy League education, people start eyeballing mortgages thinking, well, if I'm going broke, at least let it be in my own home. Of course, those people who are now looking to become homeowners are now bidding in a hot market against people who are turning homes into hotels. Next, it's simply a function of price discovery at work. Suddenly, regular people who just want to own homes are committing to monstrous debts. Because apparently, we've all agreed that living on the financial edge is part of the new economy. And just like that, a few overpriced Airbnbs have set off a market frenzy, where regular people are either priced out of their neighborhoods or trapped in mortgages that are one missed paycheck away from a meltdown. This can be suicide for a local economy who sees regular people leave because they can't afford housing, thus ruining communities and the entire reason that people wanted to visit the city in the first place. So as we wade through the consequences of turning homes into hotels, remember, it's basic economics at work. Sure, it's about greed, market hysteria, and that ever-present tradition that exists in capitalism where loopholes are used at the expense of everyone, which eventually creates problems that governments are too lazy to solve until it's too late. Yeah, you've got to help us, Doc. We've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. Okay, today we're looking at Airbnb and its impact on the housing market. Let's dive in. I want to start by looking at the history of Airbnb. Airbnb was founded in 2007 by Brian Chesky and two of his buddies who rented out air mattresses in their San Francisco apartment to travelers who couldn't find a hotel room during a conference. They called it Air Bed and Breakfast. The idea soon evolved into a website that allowed people to list, discover, and book unique accommodations around the world, from apartments and houses to castles and tree houses. Its mission, to create a world where anyone can belong anywhere, by connecting hosts who share their spaces with guests who seek local and personal experiences. Airbnb has grown rapidly since its inception, reaching over 220 countries and regions, over 4 million hosts, more than 7 million active listings, and over 1.5 a billion guest arrivals since the three friends started the idea. They have become a household name in the travel and accommodation industry. But recently, Airbnb has been facing a flurry of issues, with today's CEO, Brian, admitting that the company is fundamentally broken. Recently, he was asked by Bloomberg about how Airbnb impacts communities, and here's what he had to say. Well, I never want Airbnb to do anything other than strengthen a community. Mm -hmm. I also think it's really important to never presume that we're the good guys. Is what we're doing like good for the world mm -hmm. and to constantly reevaluate. And so for example, affordable housing, a lot of cities said, you know, we want to have some basic restrictions on how Airbnb can be used in our city. So we have like, we comply with registration systems mm -hmm. for cities. We want to make sure that like cities say they want to be able to, mm -hmm. that we have to collect our fair share of taxes. Mm -hmm. That means that they need to like change the way Airbnb exists in their city. We'll have that conversation. So Brian acknowledges it can have a nasty impact on communities, yet just last week, Airbnb asked all of the Airbnb hosts in British Columbia to contact their local MPs to complain about the provincial government eliminating short-term rentals in the province. And BC isn't the only place these crackdowns are happening. 
Over the years, various cities across the U.S. and even around the world have implemented measures to regulate or even prohibit short-term vacation rentals. This crackdown comes in the form of bans, licensing requirements, and occupancy limits, aiming to mitigate concerns like rising rent, reduced affordable housing availability, and safety issues. Hosts have been caught in the crossfire, forced to grapple with complex regulations and legal hurdles. Let's take New York City as an example. It's become one of the most restrictive and hostile markets for Airbnb in all the United States. The city has a law that prohibits renting out an entire apartment for less than 30 days unless the host is present, which effectively bans most of Airbnb's listings in New York City. Dallas has banned short-term rentals in specific neighborhoods. In a late night vote, the Dallas City Council approved a plan to eliminate most short-term rentals across the city. Single family Quebec and Memphis require licenses for short-term rental operators to keep an eye on them. And Paris now limited entire property rentals to 120 days per year. Ditto for San Francisco, who limits hosts to 90 days, and Amsterdam limits hosts to just 30 days a year. The crackdown on Airbnb is happening for a bunch of reasons. First off, it's messing with housing markets. You've got homeowners turning their properties into short-term rentals, which dries up property prices and makes it harder to find affordable housing. Then there's the tax issue. Airbnb hosts often skate by without paying the same taxes as traditional hotels, which leaves governments missing out on some much needed cash and fees. Safety is also a concern. Some Airbnb listings might not meet the same safety standards as regular hotels, putting guests at risk. Zoning regulations? Well, let's just say some Airbnb hosts aren't too worried about playing by the rules in that department. All this can disrupt local communities and mess with the neighborhood vibe. And of course, the hotel industry isn't too thrilled either. They're crying foul, claiming Airbnbs playing the game with a stacked deck. So what we have here is a bit of a showdown between the sharing economy and the interests of the local community. Now look, the crackdown on short-term rentals hasn't been without consequences. Airbnb and hosts have felt this impact in multiple ways. The company's growth and profitability have been affected in regions where these regulations have been enforced. For hosts, the crackdown poses significant challenges, such as hefty fines, permit requirements, and even bans on new bookings. For instance, hosts in Santa Rosa, California have faced the requirement of permits and caps on the number of stays under 30 days, which has led to a significant reduction in income for those hosts. Similar stories are echoed across the US from New York to California, and Airbnb hosts who depend on short-term rental income have had to navigate a complex regulatory environment. I've already heard the prospect of legal challenges being brought in relation to this legislation. Any thoughts? Uh, I'd say my firm alone has had six calls in the last three days, and uh, I expect there will be many more to many more lawyers throughout the province because this guts the economic or the business plan of many, many small individual owners who might have bought a strata lot in a, in a new building down in Old Town and thought, well, I'll put it in the Airbnb for four or five years until I retire, then I'll move in. They're done. Good. That's kind of the fucking point. Now, to be clear, I don't blame any landlords. If I was presented with the opportunity to make $2,000 per month income or $6,000, I'm going to take the 6K. Now, look, I would imagine 90% of people or more would do the exact same. But I would know that it's at the long-term cost of the community, and I'd probably tell myself something like that is for the government to figure out and prevent. But what I would understand is that I'm taking a risk that eventually the government might step in and totally ruin my business model and screw up those cash flows that I'm depending on. So with that being said, it's nice to see some places whose governments are actually showing those teeth and taking it on. In New York, for example, listings were down 39% in July compared to 2018. Boston, which imposed stricter rules in 2019, experienced a similar drop. In contrast, cities with fewer regulations are witnessing a surge in short-term listings. According to Inside Airbnb, a watchdog group tracking the platform, the number of short-term listings on Airbnb in New York City has plummeted by over 80%, dropping from 22,000 in August to a mere 3,000 by October. Also, Airbnb has observed a growing demand for medium-term bookings, lasting more than a month but less than a year. In the fourth quarter of 2022, stays of 28 nights or more were Airbnb's fastest-growing category, accounting for 22% of gross nights booked, up from 16% in 2019. This trend suggests that the market is adapting to the changing regulatory landscape. But longer stays also bring their own legal risks, particularly in cities where local eviction laws treat occupants staying over 30 days as tenants rather than guests. Cue the violins. Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. 
I honestly didn't think much about the impact of Airbnbs until I sat down to make this video. To be frank, my experience with Airbnb has been awful. Nightmare? Absolute nightmare. Worst thing I've ever experienced in my life. Scariest thing. If given the choice, I would stay in a hotel seven days a week before staying in an Airbnb just one. I could go on and tell dozens of anecdotes that I've personally experienced or been told from friends that just don't happen in hotels. And if they did, it'd be a quick call to the front lobby for help. This experience is shared by renters and travelers across social media. Here we have a user who's complaining that they're being asked to be the cleaning service and do the sanitation for their unit, all while likely being charged the cleaning fee. This guy here here is complaining that the stay at his Airbnb is $185 a night. The problem? The cleaning fee is $225. But let's get back to the point. Like this person who's advertising a real estate sale with the idea of $100,000 in potential Airbnb revenue. Now look, these conversations about the sharing economy are conversations we have to have. And we gotta ask ourselves who should win? The people who are looking for a quick arbitrage opportunity or communities that will end up looking like San Francisco if they don't step up to the plate. I believe in capitalism, but we also need guardrails. We can either stand around and shrug and say, I don't know, it's just economics as we watch guys like Ken Griffin build their next billion dollar home all while we retail investors continue to get fleeced, or we can ask the hard questions, fight the hard fights and say enough is enough. All right, everybody, thank you for watching. If you could do me a big favor, please hit that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Let me know what you think in the comment section. So guys, we just recently launched this channel and we noticed that 99.9% .9 of our viewers are not subscribed. So if you enjoyed this video, we need your help in growing this channel. By subscribing, that would help us keep the lights on and make sure that our crews have jobs in these uncertain times. So please hit that subscribe button and we promise to make more quality videos that I'm sure you're gonna love.